Eva, are you feeling cozy by the fire? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but it's great to be here. Oh my here. gosh, it's great to be here. It's yeah. so exciting. And we're going to talk about a topic that I think we both love, building a lasting company culture. Um, Eva, you have an incredible background. You're currently chief people officer and co-founder at Podimo. Um, tell us a bit more about what you did prior to Podimo, as well as what the company does. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've spent more than 15 years now in audio streaming. Um, started out my career at Last FM, which was a fantastic and greedy startup in Shoreditch in London, um, and worked there. And then I, I moved over to Spotify in the early days. Um, I got a beta invite there and just experienced that product and thought I need to work here. <laughs> Um, so I spent almost a decade at Spotify from like shy of 100 people and then all the way through to, to IPO. Um, and then uh, there I didn't work with people and culture. Um, I, I worked with creator relations, so I've always had a passion for working with people and relationships. Um, but, but yeah, and then uh, when I left Spotify, um, I, I, I moved to co-found uh, Podimo which is uh, a podcast and audio um, book platform um, and launched five and a half years ago. Uh, and um, we're available in seven markets and we have now more than 300 employees. So, Super. Yeah. Sounds like it's uh, going well. It is. We've, we've been running fast over the last five years. Super. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so, so that's, um, that, that's a bit about my background. And, and uh, now I'm chief people officer at Podimo, so really kind of just driving our culture and, and making sure that Podimo is a fantastic place to, to work. Great. And what about yourself? Yeah, so Station F, hopefully people here have been to Station F. If you haven't, I invite you all to come. So biggest startup campus based in Paris. Uh, we always have 1,000 companies, early stage companies based on campus. Um, they come from around the world. We have 65 different nationalities. It's generalist, but we have a lot of obviously AI at the moment, more and more climate and deep tech, uh, a lot of quantum computing. French market cares a lot about quantum. Um, and so I've been running the campus from day one. It's been a while. Campus has been open seven years. I've been there longer. Um, and prior to that, I was at Microsoft and TechCrunch, kind of always in the startup world. Um, and so I've had a chance to see a lot of teams, talk to a lot of teams, play the therapist for a lot of teams. So I'm really excited to talk about company culture, obviously. Yeah. Um, but Eva, I have a first question for you. So you are co-founder and chief people officer at Podimo. Yeah. When you guys started building the company, what kind of company and what kind of company culture did you guys set out to build? How did you yeah. think about it? So when we, when we first got together, um, my, the co-founders that I have, they've all also been through different journeys. They're like serial entrepreneurs. So um, we had kind of, we, we sat down and we had these four things that we wanted to, to achieve. Um, first one was the, I mean, on, on the product itself, the listening experience, we wanted to innovate the podcast listening experience and make that better. Uh, we also wanted to create content that made, like quality content that made people reflect uh, about the world around them. And then as a third pillar, it was around creator monetization. Like we wanted to introduce subscription into, into podcasting. And then the fourth pillar was around building a company that had an amazing culture and talent at its core and talent development. So that was kind of our four strategic pillars and we were very mindful of the fourth pillar that we, we wanted to create a company culture and, and we, we spoke about this quite a bit actually. We wanted to create a company culture where we had people who had fire in their eyes. People joining the company because they just really wanted to be part of the ride. And not so much because of their CV but really because they wanted to build something extraordinary. And then we wanted to have a culture where there were no sharp elbows. Like we didn't want any of that political, I'll say bullshit, I'm sorry, but <laughs> the stuff that will break the culture, the stuff that will slow you down. So and that's interesting. How do you build for that? Well, I think that, that was what we were like, let's be mindful about this from the get-go. Let's talk about it. Let's keep talking about it. And let's hold each other accountable. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and I think it was for us like, saying it out loud and then speaking with the team about it and constantly thinking about it in recruitment and so on, that, that kind of made us 
and, and we're still doing that, right? So, so, so that, was, that was really what, what, what we set out to do. Um, but then we scaled, and like any other company, like we were in hyper growth, not any other company, but we were in hyper growth, and we, we doubled the team year over year, and we didn't have, from the get-go, we didn't have anyone like specifically in HR. Um, so we were like just co-founders and just running with it, but, like I think most of you are doing as well. Um, but I could feel that, even though I was in creator relations, I, I could start to feel that, because we had grown so quickly, that the culture was started, the great culture that we set out to have and that we did have and everyone could feel it, it was starting to be diluted a little bit because we had brought in so many people and we, no one was really kind of dedicated strategically working on nurturing that culture. It, was, it just happened. Um, so I sat my CEO down and said, look, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to take the chief people role. I want to work with this on a more strategic level and I want to be that, like, we all work with culture. We all hold each other, each other accountable, but we need to have an owner of it um, and someone who sits in the lead team and someone who is there on a daily basis really thinking about this and I, I want to be that person. So I took that role um, and and I'm still in that role, and it has been an amazing journey, and I've learned so, so, like, so much, right? And the first thing I, I did when I took the role was to, to get, we had 100 people at that point, and the, the culture was clear, we could all feel it, um, which was fantastic, but I, I asked everyone then to come with their input, like, what, let's, let's, let's put some words to it, let's articulate our values, not to hang them on a wall, because, that's like, let's face it, no one wants that. <laughs> but let's articulate it so we have a common language. So we all have something to refer to. And back to the thing about holding each other accountable. But also back to hiring a lot of people. Like you need to, to know, like you need to be able to put words to the culture. Um, so we had a very kind of co-creation of putting words to our values. Um, and then I was traveling around because we're a company that's hyper-local. We, we produce content, right, like in the markets we're in, so we have local teams everywhere. So I was traveling around to the different markets and really doing workshops with them on the values we had co-created and putting some very clear behaviors to them. So it was easy for us to, to speak to and easy for us to, to build the people strategy on those values. Super, so. there's a lot of what you said that I absolutely love. I think too many early stage companies actually are not mindful of culture from day one. They have to get a product live, they have to find customers, they have to fundraise. They're not thinking about the culture enough. A lot of them are not even talking about the culture. And then they do exactly what you say. <laughs> they get a couple of little values, they write it on a board. People understand totally different things within the culture and it goes sideways. So I absolutely love, and I think it's so, so, so key what you just said, especially in the early days of building yeah. a company. Yeah, and then holding each other accountable. Yeah. And so if only every founder had an Eva that would stand <laughs> up and say, hey, I want to own this, yeah. we'd all be good. <laughs> but tell me, I mean, you, you work with a lot of early stage uh, companies at Station F. So what are the common learnings that you see uh, in setting teams, but also building the culture? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing such early teams. It even starts sometimes with the founders when they're teaming up uh, in the early days. So we see a lot of people, I mean, some of the common mistakes um, are people who want to team up with a best friend and they've never actually worked together in a professional and kind of environment. Uh, people who decide to team up too quickly, they don't get to the nitty gritty of actually where do we see this going? Do we feel the same way about a lot of things? Um, so I've seen a lot of teams that they come to you maybe the first year, two years goes okay. Um, they maybe have a few periods where things are rocky but they make it through and then it just gets bad. And so I'm seeing a lot more teams now and I think it's great. I think it's being talked about. People are sharing tips. I see a lot more teams that, for example, if they've never worked together, they do try periods. They'll say, you know, we want to spend one month, three months seeing if this works. 
they don't actually commit 100% to the long term. And I think that kind of gives people really a chance to feel each other out. Do people actually work the way that they interact otherwise? Um, so that's really great. I also see a lot more people, and I've told a lot of founders to do this, write things down. A lot of people are like, well, we talked about it. No, write it down, put it in paper. You can come back to it one day and be like, remember, we felt this way. <laughs> um, and I also see more and more people, I think now everybody knows about the co-founder dating questions, but if you haven't heard about this, look them up online. There's like 50 questions that you should ask your potential co-founder comes down to things like how can somebody get how can a co-founder get fired can we fire each other can somebody external fire us um, what kind of salary do you see yourself being paid at what point and I think it's just stuff that sometimes people just brush under the rug and they're like we'll get to it at some point no you want to talk about it from day one so I think that's the first stuff that we kind of see with uh, people teaming up that's really really key um, and the second thing I would say just because station F is so placed at the early stage is those 10 first hires and I know that Everyone talks about how key that is, but I think we can't stress it enough. That sets the tone for your company. Take your time to hire the right people, onboard them. You were talking about being mindful about the culture from the early days, that's what it is. Let go of people if you just don't see it working. I think when people start asking themselves questions, there's no question. Um, so I think that that's really a lot of what we see at Station F, and those are some of the big, big learnings that we've had. I love it. And then, I mean, when you, because you're so close to the, the, the teams that you're working with, like, how, how are you assessing what, <laughs> like, like, really, like, how do you assess and how do you spot a good culture? Like, what, what are you looking for? When? That's such a hard question. Um, so I thought about this. Um, I mean, I think we're looking, if I had to sum it up in three things, it's probably like you want something that reflects good work ethic, something that reflects ownership, and probably something that reflects well-being, because obviously if you have a great work ethic and everybody's miserable, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so I think we're, we're looking for something that reflects those three things, and striking the right balance is really where it's at, because usually you have companies that are kind of on one end or the other. Um, I think the ownership piece is what kind of gets lost as you start to scale. I think when there's more people around, people tend to not stand up, uh, they just kind of get lost in the crowd, and they're more comfortable with that. So I think building a culture where people really rise up. Um, but how do you identify that from the outside? It's yeah. really hard. And I think you have to look at places where people are staying, people are happy, people are talking about their company culture. I've, I've actually come across a couple, a couple of companies where at parties, people are talking about how amazing their, their team is and how amazing. That's, that's what you want. I don't know how you get to that. Um, and then also where things work and people are getting shit done. <laughs> and I think you yeah. want that. At the end of the day, you're company's not going to go anywhere if people are not getting stuff done. No. And what, what are your thoughts? How do you assess a good company culture? No, but exactly to your point, like that. Like, and, and I think the uh, culture, it's like, even though I said we put words to what we wanted to build in the beginning, uh, we did. But a culture is also something that you just feel. You can, you can feel it when you walk into a room. You can feel it when you walk into an office, if it's a good culture or not. Like when, and, and I, for me, and I guess it also depends on what, like, what you want to build, right? So f for me, it is that fire in your eyes and that vibe of people collaborating and just running in the same direction. Like that is when you, that you can just, there is um, energy in the room. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you're so much more articulate with than me <laughs> than you say that. Um, but Eva, you mentioned earlier that you guys just hit the five-year mark. Congrats. Yes. Over you. 300 people. I don't think a lot of companies can say that. Um, you guys, you, you're in multiple markets. You've done a couple of acquisitions. I mean, what have been the major learnings? Yeah. I mean, we... <laughs> um, many learnings, actually. And I will say... Um, we just, we just celebrated, uh, and I'm so proud of that. We, we just celebrated our five-year anniversary on a, on a little island in, in Denmark with a big forest rave, and everyone just went for it. Um, it, it was great. It was a good time. A rave? Um, a rave, a forest wow. rave. Wow. Yeah, people went to it. <laughs> that sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things, and I, like, we've had a lot of learnings, and I, I think company-wide, We've made a ton of mistakes. We've failed, we've pivoted, we've gotten ourselves up and like we've launched in markets where we've gotten beatings and all of that. 
so many learnings and so many mistakes and so many good stories to tell. Um, but the one thing, and which is also why I'm sitting here, is the one thing that I'm just really, truly proud of, and the one, not the one thing, we've gotten many things right, but one thing that I really think we've gotten right is, is the company culture. It is really like that has been like, I'm just proud of it and I'm proud of it because when I, when we're recruiting new people, like one thing is that I say it, but when I hear people going through a recruitment process and then putting words to this has been magical because I can feel your culture. I can feel the warmth. I can feel the passion that people have, the fire in their eyes. They say that. So I think like that has been a big like positive learning, if you could say, something that I'm proud of. But Otherwise, I think if I should like list a few, one, as I said in the beginning, being, being thoughtful and mindful of the culture you want to build from the get-go. Talk about it and hold each other accountable. That's a massive learning and something that I cannot stress enough. Um, then another learning has been um, don't, don't get swayed by the, the, the big CVs. Don't, don't look at a CV and just think, <laughs> okay, we're so busy and we need to run fast and I just need this person to come in because they have all the experience we need. If they're not a culture fit, don't do it because it's going to break. It's going to slow you down. If you have a team who are super motivated together and who has that part where they're running in the same direction and they have the startup vibe that we all know and love, and then you get someone in who doesn't get the culture and who has a big CV and has a lot of credentials, but will freak people out and it will break <laughs> the culture and it will slow you down and you will have to make that tough decision to let them go and then you're back at where you started. So assess for culture over CV would be a big, a, a big learning. Um, and then I think the values, like, don't set them from day one. Be, be mine or do whatever you want. Like, take my advice for what you want. Like, these are just my, my, my <laughs> experience, right? But I, I think it, for us, it was good not to set the values from day one because you, the value should come based on the culture that you've created together. And, and then co-create them. Make them feel real and make them, like, it's something that you do together with your team. And... There was one learning that I had, and that also goes back to, to, to the Spotify days, was that having values that are broad enough so that each of your team members or teams can translate them to being relevant for their own team subculture or their own local subculture, because they, they have to be broad enough so you don't have to change them again, right? I, I mean, if you need to change them, you change them, but I think we... We, at Spotify, we had one called Think It, Build It, Ship It, Tweak It. It was <laughs> perfect when we were just a tech company because you can do that. But if you then move into marketing and you're creating billboards, you can't think, build, ship, tweak a billboard when it's printed and it's on a big wall. And then, then you have to go through the process of changing your values and then you can end up with a kind of the old culture and the new culture, the old startup culture, and now there is the new culture with the new values. And I think trying to, to stay true to the values and see if you can kind of make them live throughout your journey um, is, is, is definitely a learning. Um, and then I think one thing that is working really well for us and also worked well at Spotify is doing intro days. Like it sounds so plain, but it's a culture injection. It is really kind of all the new hires. Make sure you onboard them well. Get them to the HQ. Get them to feel the, the vibe that you're creating together and kind of that, like the culture lives there. And then, then they go back to their markets and then they, they, they know the culture. They get it. And then you build from there. I think that like intro days is, is part, like it's, I love doing them as well. They're just so, so cool. Great. Now, I love the, the Spotify value as a song. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I had a question for you, though. You mentioned that you guys pivoted. Did you change your values at that point? We have not changed our values. No, no, Ever. we've no. Amazing. No, we have not. Um, we have not changed them, uh, but we keep holding each other accountable on them, and we keep looking at the behavior. And that, it can, that, that we can adjust kind of the wording around that and so on, but the values have, have stayed the same. 
Um, and then there is the startup culture. I think like the, and, and we'll touch on founder mode, but like for us, like being quite rigid on not over processing things and really trying to stay true to the, to the agile, quick, adjust, bop, 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 bop. that is something that we talk about a lot. We call each other out on when things are over processed and or pre like you know what I mean, yeah. like over like it makes us slow. Um, we call each other out on it, and as long as you do it in a caring and a respectful way, which is like then then it, then it's good, right? Like so, keeping that culture of innovation um, and and uh, yeah, again, transparency, talk about it um, is is something, and over communicate, I guess, is always, and that's something that we haven't gotten right yet. Internal communication, it's. So hard, and yeah, Always. still learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. still learning, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, so maybe founder mode. Founder mode. Found. Let's. Everybody's talking about founder mode. Let's yeah. talk about it. <laughs> Should we talk about that? Right? <laughs> Should we? Um, so what? Like, how have you seen it working? And how have you seen founder mode work versus manager mode? And what? What are your reflections on it? Yeah. Well, I think for people who have no idea what we're talking about, but I imagine everyone here has heard about founder mode. It's when Brian Chesky gave a, a speech at YC not too long ago, and he kind of talked about this huge learning where, as he was scaling his company everybody gave him advice to kind of go into manager mode where essentially you have this team of like uh, top directors or top management and you pretty much interact with them and you hope that they're managing stuff below and you kind of stop engaging really on the on the lower levels uh, of the team and he came in and said that's the biggest mistake you really want to engage you want to act like a founder you want to be on the ground you want to be seeing and talking to everyone um, and I think this resonated with a lot of people who have had that pain as they scale and they kind of feel things lose efficiency they lose touch and that's where um, they feel the company kind of loses what it had in the early days um, what we see obviously because we're working with early stage companies, we just see founder mode in its natural state. People are founders, they're in small teams. Most of the teams at Station F are between five and 15 people, maybe 20 people uh, when they're on campus, and then we see them grow. But we do see a lot of companies fall into that trap of, okay, now I have to hire managers, I have to chase the big CVs. That is the bi biggest mistake they can make. Mm -hmm. um, and then they start fixing meetings only with that top level of management, and they really lose touch with what's happening on the ground. So I think this was a super important message. And I think we are now seeing a lot of scale-up companies thinking about things very differently. Mm -hmm. How can we build you know, different moments and different teams uh, that actually mix levels? How can I make sure that I, as a CEO or a top senior executive, I'm actually spending time with people who are listening and engaging the most with our customers? Um, I think it's really, really important. Um, but tell me about how are you guys doing it? at Podio, and first of all, as somebody, as a, um, Podmo, sorry, Podmo, sorry, oh my god, you're not Podio. It's okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> thank you for the correction. But tell me how you, how you guys are doing. Are, do you feel that you are acting in founder mode? And as someone, as a chief people officer, how close are you with the founder? Yeah. Um, so I think when I first heard about founder mode, I was like, yes, this is... <laughs> This is it. This is this is how we operate, and this is our CEO Morton. He's the essence of it. Like that is how he's he he is operating. Really, kind of always being into the detail, or going up in the helicopter and being super strategic, and then down in like what's happening with the CAC in Germany? Why is that increasing? Or it's like uh, how can you span that? Like, but it. But I think it gives. Uh, relevance and an agility to the company, and uh, it's 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 great. Um, in terms of how close we are, we're super close, right? Like as co-founders, and we we're, we 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 sit together every day. Um, and I think that if I should give any other advice as well, is getting the people function to sit in the lead team and very closely together with the CEO is is key because you. You position your culture as critical and strategic, and 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 it becomes the center of a lot of the decisions that you make when you're this closely aligned. I think so. So we are very closely aligned. We're from day one to today, 
very aligned on the culture we want to build, and that makes the culture resonate and relevant with everyone. So it's not just the people team over here saying, this is the culture we want to build, but it's actually reflected in the whole lead team and by the CEO as well. So, so we're very close, and I, I, I can only kind of recommend having that close relationship. Um, and it makes, because we all face difficult decisions, right? We go through, you know, if it's layoff rounds, if it's reorgs, if it's like big pivots, one thing is to think about it from the numbers and from this is direction we need to take, but having the people in the middle of it and making that a big part of the strategic decision just, just makes it um, much more relevant for, for the whole company and, and makes, it, makes it live, basically. Um, so it, it makes it uh, very central. Um, and then, yeah, I think like we, we as I said, we, we, we talk about it a lot. He talks about our culture, I talk about it. We ask our team for input all the time through surveys, through real kind of conversations all the time so we can, so we can adapt together. Super, yeah. so important. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I have a question for you, but now I can't remember, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, innovation. Yes, that's innovation. What I, yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted to ask you about. So yeah, there is a lot of innovation um, happening right now with HR initiatives and practices. Um, and, and what about like when, when we're looking at the tools, like what innovation are you seeing when it comes to HR tools? Also with the focus on, and I think very important for because it is hard to build company cultures today with like being remote and in the office and not in the office. So, so what, are you, what are you seeing? Super, and I think we're running uh, towards the end, so this is probably gonna be our, our last question. Um, but yeah, we're seeing so much happening in the HR tech space, and it's one of the domains that I love. I do a little bit of angel and scout investing, and I've done a lot in the HR tech space. At Station F, we actually have a HR tech program um, with the organization called La Berrache and Deal, which I think a lot of people know here. So obviously, we're seeing tons of stuff around remote and distributed teams, um, whether it be just for the basics of kind of like administrative stuff or actually trying to get people to connect when they're not in the same office. Um, a lot of stuff there. Obviously, AI has brought in a ton of amazing um, new kind of agents that can actually kind of bring down the HR uh, workflow. So we're seeing a lot of uh, automation around, you know, candidate screening, um, applications, things like that can actually go out and hunt for candidates and bring them in and put them in the funnel and kind of wheel that down for HR teams. Um, so there's actually some companies that, um, that I wanted to mention. Holly AI is one that I love, so they actually help uh, with the, a tool for screening. We also have a company at Station F called Bluco. They use WhatsApp. They kind of screen candidates using WhatsApp because not everybody is on LinkedIn, believe it or not. I think in our world, a lot of people are on LinkedIn, but there are a lot of jobs, people who work uh, on construction sites, in restaurants, what have you. Um, they actually don't always have a CV ready at hand, and so they actually have developed a great tool that screens candidates through WhatsApp. Um, we have other companies that are working on pay transparency. I think within the startup ecosystem, a lot of comp and Ben, there's so many questions. How much is that guy getting paid? Are salaries going up? I think right now AI is living in an incredible salary explosion, uh, at least in France. Um, and so it's great to have a tool that offers that transparency. So we have a, a company called Figures HR, where you can actually not see what specific companies are paying, but you can have an idea of this type of uh, job in the startup ecosystem is being paid this salary and getting this kind of base and this kind of package. Um, a lot around analytics, obviously. People want to be able to predict their turnover, be able to you know, control different factors. There's some great dashboards out there. I think Reflect is a company that's gained a lot of traction, um, at least in the French market. And there's a lot, obviously, around employee well-being. We're seeing more and more around mental health. We've got some companies like Teal, who's come out of Station F, Mocha.care. They're offering kind of B2B um, mental health solutions for employees. They can actually you know, ping employees in the office and say, do you need to speak to somebody? And they can kind of do that private 
privately within the platform. There's also now a new wave around uh, feminine healthcare. Employees yeah. can actually benefit from a better feminine healthcare, whether it be um, protection against endometriosis and things like that. So we're seeing kind of waves around different themes in a B2B space. And one that has kind of blown my mind is the high-end employee checkups. So we have a company in France called Zoi, and they've kind of built a hybrid between a high-end clinic and almost a spa. And in a B2B way, people can actually experience a very thorough checkup for kind of high-end um, uh, employees. I could go on for hours about innovation in HR tech, as you guys can see, but I think we're running low on time. So I will wrap it up and say, Eva, it's been amazing speaking about this with you. Um, I absolutely love the company culture that you guys have built. I, it just, you can feel it from being next to you on stage. So I want to know, what are you guys hiring for? And then we'll get off stage. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hiring, well, we're hiring for fire in your eyes. Basically, we're hiring for fun. Oh, in terms of like roles, share the roles as well. Oh, <laughs> was, but we are hiring for fire in your eyes and positive performance culture, no sharp elbows, being a team player and come in and just wanting to do great things. That's really kind of the passion that we are hiring for. And uh, we have a bunch of roles. Go to our career site. There are actually quite a few roles open at the moment. Um, we have everything from content creation to strategy and ops. And there are a few open roles. And uh, come my way. Super. It's great. It's great to have been here with you. Thanks so much, Eva. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank you.